My goal tonight is to teach you something about science in general, and evolution in particular. I'm going to assume that you're intelligent, but to some degree uninformed about these fields. Uh, there are some common misconceptions about the theory of evolution, but basically it just says that all living organisms on Earth today are descended from a few species that lived many millions of years ago. One big misconception about evolution is that it's somehow anti-God, but in fact nothing in evolution argues against the existence of God. I believe the process of evolution is part of God's creation. Another big misconception is that evolution is, quote, just a theory, unquote, uh, but in fact there's extensive evidence for it, and that's what I'm going to tell you tonight. When we want to understand or explain something, we use the scientific method, which is really just careful application of, of common sense. First, we form a hypothesis, and then we test it. We do this by deriving deductions or predictions that follow logically from the hypothesis, uh, and then testing those predictions by observations and experiments. A good hypothesis has to be, in principle, falsifiable. That means there must be tough tests which, if the hypothesis were really wrong, would disprove it. Uh, then, if the hypothesis passes all those tough tests, we conclude that it must be true. So let's take a look at the hypothesis uh, of Dr. Hovind concerning the history of life on Earth, creationism. This says that the Earth and all living species were created in one week, about 4,000 BC. Species don't change, and the Earth's features were shaped pretty much by a worldwide flood about 2400 BC. Now, 200 years ago, pretty much everybody accepted this, even Charles Darwin was a creationist as a young man, but then people began to test it as a scientific hypothesis, and it failed all the tests. It became clear that the Earth is much older than 6,000 years, it's millions of years old, that living species can change over long periods of time, and that there just isn't any evidence for the supposed worldwide flood. So, Charles Darwin came up with the hypothesis of evolution by natural selection. This says the Earth is very old, living things can change over generations, many generations. Uh, living species can diversify into two or more separate species, and all species on Earth are descended from a few ancestral forms that lived in the distant past. The idea of evolution had been around before Darwin, but he made two big contributions. First, he proposed a plausible mechanism for how living things could change, natural selection. This says there are inherited variations among individuals. We now know that this is due to chance mutations, uh, chance genetic mutations, and second, variable, uh, sorry, variations which favor survival and reproduction will be selected because they have a better chance to make it into the next generation. Similarly, unfavorable traits will be discarded. Darwin's second big contribution was that he followed the second, sorry, he followed the scientific method very explicitly, deducing predictions from his hypothesis and then testing them. And I'm going to go through Darwin's deductions as well as some more modern ones. Uh, Darwin's deductions number one through four were tests of natural selection. There isn't time to discuss them now, uh, but it has been well established by field studies and mathematical models that natural selection works. In fact, it's got great practical relevance to understanding things like antibiotic-resistant germs and pesticide-resistant insects. Uh, even creationists acknowledge, as they must because of these examples, that natural selection works, but they, they claim that it can only lead to small genetic changes. Uh, in fact, given, en given enough time, major changes are not only possible but inevitable. For example, in human cells, about 50 to 100 mutations creep in per human generation. That's not much, but if it goes on for a million generations, several percent of the human DNA will have changed. So small changes can accumulate, and given enough time, the character of a species can change significantly. Now, this implies, uh, from this it follows that if evolution is true, the Earth must be a lot older than 6,000 years, and it is. Uh, astronomy, geology, and biology together provide us with a coherent and consistent view that the Earth is about four and a half billion years old. Now, we can actually date rocks fairly precisely using radioactive atoms, and I want to take a minute to explain this, 
Radioactive decay is where one kind of atomic nucleus decays into another, like rubidium-87 decaying into strontium-87. The decay occurs at a constant rate, which is expressed as the half-life, the time it takes for half the remaining rubidium nuclei to turn into strontium. Uh, and we know the half-life of rubidium-87. That can be determined. So basically, if we measure the ratio of rubidium-87 to strontium-87, we can figure out how old the rock is. Uh, in practice, rubidium-87, strontium-87, and another strontium isotope are measured in many different minerals within the same rock. And the results are plotted. If the rock is just formed, those uh, will form a um, straight line. But if the rock has been around for a while, and if the, and if the um, uh, composition hasn't changed since it was formed, the points will fall on a straight line called an isochron, and the slope of that line tells the age. Uh, here's an example of a rock from Michigan that was dated this way at three and a half billion years using 30 different minerals within the same rock. Results can also be checked by using other isotopes. There's quite a few different isotope systems that can be used. The take-home lesson is that radioisotopic dating is really far more sophisticated and reliable than creationists would have you believe. Okay, so far we have a mechanism for gradual genetic change and enough time to account for lots of such changes. But has evolution really occurred? Well, Darwin's deduction number six is that if evolution has occurred, then species that lived in the remote past should be different from those that live today. Uh, and we can test this because we have fossils. It turns out that the vast majority of fossil species are different than those alive today, and that doesn't just include dinosaurs. Now, we can actually make a more sophisticated deduction. Deduction number seven, uh, if evolution is true, that predicts that the percentage of fossils, uh, fossil species that are the same as contemporary species should be lower in the older rocks than in the more recent ones. I note that the older rocks are those that are lower down because they were laid down first, and the newer ones were laid down on top of them. And this has been tested many times and confirmed always. Here is some data from Lyell in 1854, which was before Darwin published his work. Uh, in the more recent Pliocene rocks, you can see here, 96% of the fossil species were the same as species that are still alive. And in the older Eocene rocks down here, only 3% were the same. OK. Uh, Deduction number eight, if evolution is true, it must be possible to demonstrate the slow change of one species into another. In Darwin's time, there weren't enough fossils to, to test this prediction, but now there are. Uh, the ancestry of the modern horse shown here is one of the best known examples, but there are lots of others. But we don't even have to rely on fossils to test this prediction. Here's an example. Herring gulls and lesser black-headed gulls in Europe can't interbreed, and that's what defines them as separate species. But the herring gulls of Europe here can interbreed with gulls in North America, and they can interbreed with gulls further west, and so on in a continuous chain around the Earth until you get back to the lesser black-headed gull in Europe. What this demonstrates is the slow change of one species into another geographically. Uh, and there are many similar examples. OK, deduction number nine. If evolution is true, there must be a mechanism by which species can diverge in, by which one species can diverge into two species. Uh, well, there are such mechanisms. Um, here's how it works. Remember, a species is a population of individuals who can all interbreed. The first step is that such a population gets separated into two subpopulations, by a natural barrier, for example, or maybe by occupying different niches in the environment. Uh, and then, once they're separated like that, gradual genetic changes will take place in the two populations, and they will be independent because they're not interbreeding. They will change in different directions, and that can lead to chromosome rearrangements 
things like incompatibility between the eggs and the sperm, and other physiological changes which result in the subpopulations then becoming unable to interbreed. Uh, so the result is two separate species. The classic example of this is the uh, finches of the Galapagos, which Darwin studied, which got isolated on the different islands of the Galapagos, and so they diverged into multiple species. Here's another example closer to home. The leopard frogs of Nebraska can interbreed with the leopard frogs of Wisconsin, and the leopard frogs of Wisconsin can interbreed with the leopard frogs of New England. But the leopard frogs of Nebraska can't interbreed with the ones in New England. So if something were to happen to wipe out the ones in Wisconsin and others that might be in between, uh, you would have two separate species. And that's how speciation can occur. OK, deduction number 10. If all of today's species are descended from a common ancestor, as evolution says, there should be connecting forms between the major groups. Well, this was a big, Darwin was going out on a limb when he made this prediction. There were no transitional fossils known in 1859, but just a few la years later, Archaeopteryx was discovered, which has dozens of skeletal characteristics of reptiles, such as a bony tail and teeth, but it also has obvious characteristics of birds, feathers and wishbone and wings, for example. And many other transitional fossils have since been discovered. Now, deduction 11, if there's a unity of life based on common descent, then this should be reflected in the structure of cells. And it is. All cells uh, have similar features. I won't go through them in detail. But then within these similarities, there are patterns of differences, which are explained by the theory of evolution, but not by creationism. Deduction number 12, unity of life based on common descent predicts common molecular processes. This, too, is what we find. DNA, RNA, and proteins are in all organisms, and common mechanisms of metabolism. Uh, control mechanisms. Uh, this last part means that we can learn a lot about human cancer by studying yeast. Interestingly, the genetic code uh, is not quite universal. It turns out there are some exceptions to the universal genetic code. And Evolution can predict how the pattern of those exceptions occurs, but with creationism, they ought, they ought to be all the same, or, or else no creation, no uh, similarities at all. OK, deduction number 13. It should be possible for proteins to evolve new functions, if evolution is true. And it's possible. Genes can be duplicated. This involves transposons. And the uh, mechanism is well known. Uh, and interestingly, many of these genes become pseudogenes, which don't do anything. They just sit there because the sequences that promote the gene activity have been lost. Once a gene has been duplicated, then it, the two genes can evolve in separate ways. And sometimes you get new proteins with new functions. There's a lot of examples of this, but it's even becoming important industrially, as in the reference sets here at the bottom, for developing new enzymes that don't exist in nature. OK, deduction 14. If members of a group share common ancestry, this should be reflected in their anatomy. Uh, and there's a lot of examples of this. It's very familiar. The homologous bones in vertebrate limbs is just one example. Deduction 15. Common ancestry should be reflected in embryonic development. Uh, again, there are tremendous similarities. This is because evolution works by modifying what's already there. So since animals, sorry, mammals descended from fish, it's not surprising that an early human embryo has gill slits and a tail, which later disappear. Uh, interestingly, astonishing progress is made just in the last 10 years in understanding the molecular biology of embryological development. Uh, so we are now beginning to learn how new organs and body plans can evolve by modification of previously existing genetic programs. This is the cover of one of the many new textbooks in the growing field of evolutionary developmental biology. OK, evolution predicts a unique and consistent family tree showing the relatedness of different species. Uh, this sort of thing used to be done by comparing anatomy. And the idea is that there's always nested patterns when you compare different uh, features. But the best and most 
Uh, reliable and objective family trees of this type come from similarities in proteins and DNA. Suppose we compare three species, uh, a, a particular gene in species X, Y, and Z. We measure genetic distance between each pair of species by counting the number of differences in the DNA sequences. For example, here, four differences between X and Y, four between X and Z, and two between Y and Z. Uh, and based on that, we predict a relatedness that Y and Z are more closely related. Uh, I should point out this is usually done with genes with thousands of DNA subunits, and this is shown with only six just for uh, illustration. But this would predict a family tree like this. And once you have that family tree, that in turn predicts that the same pattern would be observed in all genes, not just this particular one. Uh, this is pretty surprising from the creationist point of view. Compare the shark, the dolphin, and the mouse. If these were created independently, you would expect the shark and the dolphin to be more closely related in at least some genes, uh, but they aren't. In fact, dolphins and mouse are more closely related in all genes because they have more recent common ancestors. Uh, here's another example of, of a family tree of vertebrates based on a few proteins. Uh, and here's one for the entire, uh, all the kingdoms of life based on ribosomal RNA. Okay, another deduction, this is the last one. Sets of chromosomes in related species should differ by a small number of chromosomal rearrangements. Uh, and this is always found to be the case. In fact, you can use these kinds of similarities uh, in the same way to create family trees. And there's um, an exam another example up here on this poster board you can look at later. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you use chromosomal rearrangements to make these trees, or DNA, or protein. Uh, you always come up with the same family tree, which is exactly what evolution predicts. An important and useful consequence of this evolutionary relatedness is that we can use lower organisms as models to learn about human diseases. There are 280 genetic diseases in man for which the gene has been identified, and it has recently been found that the fruit fly has two-thirds of those genes. Now, Dr. Hovind might say this is because they have a common designer, but a nuclear power plant and a light bulb are both designed by General Electric do you think we can learn about two-thirds of the things that go wrong with a nuclear power plant by studying a light bulb? I somehow doubt it. Uh, in conclusion, evolution is a good scientific hypothesis because it makes many testable predictions. It suggests experiments and observations that we can do. And most importantly, it's potentially falsifiable or disprovable. This means that it makes such strong predictions that if they were not confirmed, the hypothesis would have to be rejected. Uh, and I challenge Dr. Hovind to tell us why creationism deserves consideration as a scientific hypothesis. Tell us what predictions it makes. Tell us how it could, in principle, be falsified. Tell us what observations or experiments could, even in principle, disprove it. But. Evolution is more than just a hypothesis. Its major predictions have been confirmed, as I've shown you examples. Uh, it has withstood people's best attempts to disprove it. It stood up to some really rough tests that could have easily disproven it if it hadn't been true. For example, suppose the world really were only 6,000 years old, like Dr. Hovind says. Then we would have determined the ages of lots of rocks and none of them would have been more than 6,000 years ago, uh, more than 6,000 years old, and so evolution would have been in the trash. But that's not what happened. Uh, another example, if species were really related, sorry, really created independently, then we might have found that dolphins had half their genes similar to sharks and the other half similar to mice. Uh, and so evolution would have been disproved, but that didn't happen. Another thing about evolution is that it explains things that no other hypotheses can. And as I mentioned, it's been extraordinarily useful in guiding productive research. This is why evolution is accepted by virtually all biologists, geologists, and biochemists. Uh, and that's why it, it deserves to be called a theory. A scientific theory is not just a hypothesis. It's just something that's been well established. Uh, and indeed, it's not only a reasonable theory, as we are de debating, it's one of the most important and the best established theories 
in modern science. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Holden will have 10 minutes for rebuttal, and then he will also be allotted 20 minutes to present his side of creation. All right. Well, thank you so much for being so patient. I apologize for being late. I missed, or I didn't miss, the first flight was canceled leaving Pensacola. So uh, they said, the quickest we can get you there is 5 o'clock. I said, well, how far drive is it from there to Oshkosh? They said, two hours. I said, let me drive. We will cut that down some. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. But it's an honor, uh, honor to be here tonight, and I appreciate you all coming out. Um, what we're supposed to be discussing tonight is basically the question, is evolution a reasonable scientific theory? I think we need to, first of all, uh, define a few terms here. Um, evolution has quite a few different meanings. I got these straight out of the dictionary here. Uh, an unrolling, an unfolding process. Um, the one we're discussing here tonight is probably more relates to number four. It uh, has, has to do with biology. The development of a species, organism, etc., from its original to its present state. Now, this definition of evolution is a little bit deceitful. What happens, as I'll show you in a minute, a lot of other things are uh, smuggled in along with this definition. There is no question the organisms we have today are descended from their ancestors, obviously. And there is no question there have been some changes. Now the question is, how far do the changes go, and where do you leave science and enter religion, speculation? The Christians have no argument, uh, the creationists have no argument with ch th organisms changing, but we think they're, cha they're limited to the same kind. Several times, Dr. Paulson tonight uh, emphasized the changing of species, the changing of species. Well, now, species is kind of a nebulous term. A dog, a wolf, and a coyote are a different species. Look them up. Canis lupus, canis domesticus, but they're interfertile. Nobody's ever nailed down a good, hard, solid definition of species. The examples he gave of the gulls, you know, not being able to interbreed, well, stand 30 feet away and look at it. It's still a bird. Okay? It's a gull. That's not evolution. The Bible never says they're going to bring forth after their species. The Bible said they bring forth after their kind. And just because you get two animals that end up being slightly different variety that some scientist today decides to call them a new species, it doesn't mean they're a different kind. I did not see one example this evening so far of any evolution showing a different kind of animal. It's just what, they, what somebody calls a new species. So, if we're going to deal with the development of, of species, organisms, etc., from its present to its, to its from its original to its present state, or that all species descended from earlier forms, I'll go along with that. Evolution happens, but that's not what the textbooks teach. They go many steps beyond this and teach the kids that all life forms came from one common ancestor. Probably all the dogs came from a common ancestor, and it was a dog. It doesn't mean the dog and the banana are related. Okay, let's define a few more here, a few more terms. Reasonable, able to reason, fair, just, wise, sensible, not excessive. To say that a dog and a wolf have a common ancestor is reasonable, it's wise, it's sensible. To say that a dog and a banana have a common ancestor is not wise and not reasonable and, and not sensible. Now, if you want to believe that, that's fine, but that's not science. Science means to know things that we can observe or test or demonstrate. A branch of knowledge, one that systemizes facts, principles, methods, skill, or technique. The basic word is knowledge, things that we can know. What can we observe, we can test, we can prove? I will contend tonight that absolutely nothing in evolution above the species level, if you want to use that word, can be proven. It's all speculation. It's all fairy tale. It didn't happen. Now, if you want to believe it happened, that's fine. You're welcome to believe that, but quit calling it science and quit using my tax dollars to put it in our school system with, with real science because it doesn't belong there at all. Theory. <laughs> A speculative plan that has been observed to some degree. By the first definition of evolution, yes, we have observed, there's no question, that animals can produce a lot of varieties. But I contend the variations have limits. Here's how science is supposed to work. You observe the universe, you create a hypothesis, 
or theory to explain the observations, and then you present evidence to support your theory. He asked in his closing remarks if I could provide some, uh, uh, let's see, well, why should creation be considered as a scientific theory? He wants me to present some predictions. Let me give you in a nutshell what the creationist uh, model presents, and then we'll make a few predictions. The creation view says about 6,000 years ago, there was an instantaneous creation. All organisms were created together in six days. Uh, I would predict based on this that we would find billions of examples of symbiosis relationships of certain plants that require certain animals and certain animals that require certain plants that defy explanation by slow, gradual evolutionary uh, accumulation of mutations. I think we'll find lots of examples in nature, if you just open your eyes and look for them, things that could not have evolved bit by bit. Read Darwin's Black Box by Michael Behe. You'll see the irreducible complexity exists all over the universe. Then the creationists teach that these animals will bring forth after their kind. Keep that word kind in mind, not species. The argument is not about species. The argument is about where do different kinds come from. And I don't know if the kind is the same as our family level or genus level or where exactly it is. I'm not sure that our classification system that Carolus Linnaeus developed is the same one that God intended or that God made. I don't know. But I think it's pretty obvious to a three-year-old that a dog and a banana are a different kind and a dog and a wolf are the same kind. A horse and a zebra might have a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. Stand back and look at it. It's still the same kind of animal. So I predict we will find animals able to produce only after their kind and that there will be no examples found of anything producing a fundamentally different kind of animal. A black gull and a white gull are the same kind of animal. And then, I, according to the creation model, there was a flood 4,400 years ago. The world was totally destroyed. I would predict because of this worldwide flood, we will find sediment layers all over the world containing trillions of fossils of dead things. I predict that the pre-flood world was loaded with trees and they would be buried and form layers of coal. I predict if we dig down in the ground, we will find coal and it will most often be found in layers, stratified layers. I predict, based upon this model of a worldwide flood, we will find petrified trees standing straight up, running through multitudes of layers, proving the layers are not different ages, like the textbooks teach. And I taught her science for 15 years, and I'll show you pictures in a minute. I predict, based on this flood, we will find that all people in the world descended from a, a common family. And when you look at mitochondrial DNA and the way it slowly changes, they find, sure enough, we've got a common ancestor. There's been big deals in the newspaper about that. Mitochondrial Eve. They say, oh, everybody descended from a common woman. Well, I could have told them that. I can even tell them her husband's name. <laughs> and a couple of the kids. Uh, so with, with uh, science, you're supposed to observe the universe, create a hypothesis, and present the evidence to support your theory. I, there's my theory. I predict we will find billions of dead things buried in sediment layers, laid down by a massive worldwide flood. I predict we will find erosion marks that cannot be explained by the current rivers that are flowing through, like, for instance, Grand Canyon. The top of Grand Canyon is nearly a mile higher than where the river enters the canyon. That river didn't make that canyon unless you believe rivers flow uphill. The top of the Kaibab uplift is 6,900 6, feet at its lowest and 8,500 feet at its highest. It ranges between seven and 8,000 feet above sea level. The river at the base of Grand Canyon is 1,800 feet above sea level, but the river enters the canyon at 2,800 feet above sea level. Check it out. Rivers don't flow uphill. The strata are not bended like they were slowly uplifted. It's all horizontal bedding. That, that Grand Canyon was formed by the flood as the flood waters ran off. Grand Canyon is a beach, breached dam across the Kaibab uplift. There's no possible way that river made that canyon. Go to the north side of Mount St. Helens, where I was a few months ago, and you'll see the little bitty Toodle River, about 15 feet wide, flows through this massive canyon that's 1,000 feet wide. The canyon was made in 15 minutes. After Mount St. Helens erupted and blew all the mud down into the valley, dammed up the little creek, five days later the river backed up far enough and got over the top of the dam, washed out a miniature Grand Canyon in 15 minutes. And at the bottom is a little bitty creek called the Toodle River, and I guarantee you, some brilliant professor someday is going to bring his kids down there and say, kids, you see this little bitty river? It made this big canyon. took millions of years. <laughs> no, teacher, it just took a few minutes. A few minutes of a massive worldwide flood. The evolution view says we all came from a rock as the earth cooled down 4.6 billion years ago and hardened into a rocky crust. And 
All life forms come from a common ancestor. I think that has been proven wrong numerous times. We, we see no evidence of that whatsoever. The Bible warned us about science that is falsely so-called. I'm convinced this evolution theory is a great uh, exaggeration from the facts. The facts are we see animals produce variations. Darwin noticed a lot of varieties of finches, 14, varieties of pigeons. But then he extrapolated that way beyond the facts, and it became a religious worldview that destroys Christians' faith in the Bible. And it keeps non-Christians from even examining the claims of Christianity. And I think uh, this evolution theory is not only dumb, it's dangerous. Most kids that go from Christian homes to secular schools will lose their faith Mr. by the Holden, end of their first year of college. Um, ten minutes before rebuttal is okay. up. Um, so to be able to can start with the um, presenting your case, uh, unless it's just a continuation. Uh, but our people will begin now to uh, start picking up uh, questions. But I want to remind you that uh, Prof Professor Paulson will be finishing with his rebuttal. And uh, we'll make a couple of go-throughs for picking up the questions. So be sure that uh, if you still want to wait until after Professor Paulson is done speaking, uh, um, we'll be, we will be picking up those questions again and uh, going through those um, to be um, fair. I just want to remind, uh, that again, no, keep, save the uh, applause for afterwards. And um, I also wanted to mention that uh, we're using this uh, debate as a fundraising uh, um, function for our student organization. And we ask that if anyone here or everyone here that enjoyed tonight's program uh, would like to see such things as this uh, uh, brought to campus more often. Um, we're, we're doing this, we're trying to do this as best we can in a very unbiased uh, uh, way to, to moderate. Um, we will be having uh, tables outside where we can t uh, take uh, your kind contributions. And thank you. Uh, and uh, Mr. Hoven, then, uh, you have 20 minutes for your presentation. Then. All right. Thank you, sir. Let me give you a little history of what happened uh, to this, make this evolution theory become so popular in the, la in the last uh, few centuries. Charles Darwin, fresh out of Bible college at age 22 in 1831, set sail on the HMS Beagle. As Darwin sailed around the world, he came to the Galapagos Islands where he counted 14 different varieties of finches based on their beak shape. Charlie counted the finches, killed all, all of them he could find. He hated birds because he loved worms. He was kind of a strange fella. But uh, Charlie shot lots of birds and collected them and put them into piles and said there were 14 different varieties of finches. He concluded that all the finches had a common ancestor. Well, I bet you're right, Charlie. It was a bird. And then Charlie said in his book on page 170, it is a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. I want to hold on just a minute, Charlie. You see 14 kinds of birds and you conclude the birds and the bananas are related? That's quite a stretch, don't you think? He's going way beyond the observed evidence. He left his science and went into his religion. And textbooks are really good at that, about mixing science and religion all the time. They say, we can't have religion in schools. Well, we've got religion in schools as long as we have evolution in there. See, Charlie observed microevolution. Dogs produce a variety of dogs. Roses produce a variety of roses. This is a fact, folks. It happens. It's observable. And some people might call these different kinds of roses a new species, and they get all excited. Wow, we have a new species. Or a gull in, in this example. It's still the same kind of animal. That's not the real issue here behind evolution. The Bible says the animals are going to bring forth after their kind, not species. See, evolution is religious. There are six different meanings to the word. We have cosmic evolution. That would be the Big Bang. That's what the textbooks teach. Twenty billion years ago, there was a Big Bang. Now, if Mr. Paulson does not believe what I'm about to share for definitions for evolution, if he doesn't think that's really fair to call that part of evolution, then please join me, Mr. Paulson, in getting this kind of garbage out of our textbooks. Because this is included with the evolution theory as far as the kids are concerned. They think that's part of evolution. Then we have chemical evolution, if evolution really happened. And the Big Bang, I mean, the Big Bang produced hydrogen and helium. How did we get the higher elements? There are at least 92 elements naturally occurring, plus the synthetic ones. How do you get those? It's true that some of these higher elements form in stars, but now you've already got a star as a furnace or a factory to produce this. Originally, from your Big Bang, how did you get all these higher chemi chemicals? Or if the stars evolve first, then you can replace three, two and three. You can switch order. What about stellar and planetary evolution? 
Nobody has ever observed one star forming. None. We've seen lots of them blow up. Nobody's ever seen one form. And there are several out there. I mean, step outside and take a look. There's enough stars out there that right now everybody on earth could own two trillion of them to themselves. That's the ones they know of. Then you'd have to have organic evolution. That's the origin of life. Nobody's ever seen non-living material come alive. The definition he chose for evolution was interesting because it started with living organisms changing. Well, okay, then if you don't believe this is part of the real evolution, then help me get this out of the textbooks because the students are taught that non-living material came alive. They are taught spontaneous generation, I assure you. Here's a typical textbook. 4.6 billion years ago, the earth cooled down. As the earth formed, it was like the moon, and there were hot pools of bubbling lava. And oceans formed as it rained on the rocks for millions of years. Yes, boys and girls, millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. Now, if this is not really part of the argument about evolution, then help me get this junk out of the textbooks. If you really want to make the argument about evolution, variations, you know, one, two species coming from a common kind, well, then I'll, I'll join you on that. That happens, okay? But they're sneaking in a lot of other stuff under this umbrella of evolution. This textbook says the first self-replicating systems must have emerged from this organic soup. Swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Well, I guess it is. It's totally stopped. It doesn't happen at all. That's how slow it is. But the kids are taught this kind of stuff. Now, you have to really watch this. I've learned in the last couple of years, the evolutionists are backing off of pushing their whole theory, and they're trying to get the kids to bite off a little bitty chunk and believe in microevolution, which is certainly true. They're trying to change the definition to mean only changing in living organisms after they've come alive. But I'm telling you, this other stuff is in the books, folks. This one tells the kids, the humans, the birds, and the crocodiles have a common ancestor. Now, that's not observed. This is somebody's religion. They've mixed it in with science. Everything inside this circle is religious speculation. You might see a variety of crocodiles, and you might see a variety of humans coming from a common ancestor, but that doesn't prove the crocodile and the human are related. See, they're really, these evolutionists are really good, and I must admire their enormous faith. They're able to take a little bit of evidence and extrapolate it to mean a whole lot more than is obvious. They assume, because they see, you know, several different species of gulls, that this proves the gulls and the bananas and the people are related. Then we have to have um, macroevolution. That's changing between major kinds of animals. That's never been observed. Speciation is not macroevolution. Microevolution, variations within the kinds, not species, that has been observed and that one is scientific. The first five are religious. So when I say evolution is a religion, that's exactly what I'm meaning. And trust me, all six of them are put in together. This one is science, and I object to calling it microevolution, but we're kind of stuck with the word. It's just a variation, folks. That's all that's ever been observed. And I, I guarantee by the end of the evening, you will not have heard one example of anything above this level right here. There are no known examples of any kinds of evolution above the speciation level. The evolutionists believe all life forms appeared came from a common ancestor three billion years ago. Now today we have 250 varieties of dogs. Some say more than that. Depends how you count them. And they probably had a common ancestor. It was a dog. And some people might say they're different species, or subspecies. Okay, well you can pick any terms you want, but they're the same kind of animal. That certainly doesn't prove what the evolutionist theory teaches, that all the dogs of the world, yeah, you got a variety, big dogs and little dogs. And a three-year-old will tell you it's the same kind. Let's take a test here. We've got a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? And a three-year-old can figure it out, okay? They're the same kind. And this is where the argument comes in. See, the evolutionists believe all forms of life came from one ancestor, and that ancestor came from a rock. It rained on the rocks for millions of years and produced soup in the oceans, and the ocean soup came alive. That's exactly what they're teaching. And I resent that. See, they try to make the, make the kids make a gigantic leap of faith and logic to going from the observed microevolution into believing in macroevolution. And that's where the whole problem comes in. Macroevolution is a fantasy. It's based upon imagination. And they keep arguing about where is this line. I, I'm sure I'll get the question later on. What's the exact definition of kind? Well, I don't know exactly. I think from the Bible we would have to conclude it's those that were originally able to reproduce and produce viable offspring. And they may have diversified now to where a horse and a zebra maybe aren't, you know, interfertile. 
Uh, maybe they still are, I don't know. But um, It's obviously the same kind. I think the kind was the original reproducing pairs of animals. So the number six, microevolution, is true, but other five get smuggled in, and the kids are deceived. They're given one definition of evolution, like descent with modification. Like this one says, evolution is change over time. In other words, there is no doubt that living things have changed over time. Notice this now. They're starting with living things, aren't they? Well, if you want to start there, then great. Everything before that, let's help me get it out of the textbooks. All this origin of life from non-living material stuff, that stuff ought to be removed. This one says, evolution is defined as a change in species over time. Now, folks, I'm here to tell you that is not really what they mean. They're using this as a hook to get the kids to believe in evolution, and then they're going to switch it to the real definition. They're going to include cosmic evolution and organic evolution. And anybody that doesn't believe in all six definitions is going to be told, well, you don't understand science. <laughs> Inevitably, in every debate I do, the opponent, will, somewhere along the line, will say, well, the average audience just doesn't understand the complexity of these things. Translated, that means, I'm smart, you're too dumb. I guarantee you'll get that impression somewhere along the line. If you listen to the evolutionists talk long enough, they want you to think, you're just too dumb to understand it. You need to come to this college and take a bunch of courses. So you can finally understand all the complexities of evolution. See, in advertising, it's called bait and switch. If I said, I'm going to give you a new Mercedes for 10 bucks. You showed up at my house, and I said, well, I'm sorry, uh, how about this one? It's only 99000 <laughs> That's called bait and switch. That's illegal. People go to jail for that. And I think some of these textbook authors ought to go to jail for baiting the kids to believe in evolution with one definition and then switching it midstream. And trust me, that's exactly what they do. We've got no quarrel with truth, folks. And I've got no quarrel with science. I love science. But tonight, I suspect you're going to continually hear evolution trying to be smuggled in with science. And I, trust, I assure you, I won't let it happen. Not under my watch, anyway. Evolution is not science. I object to lies being included in the textbooks. There is no real evidence for evolution. I'd like to find out from the You asked me several questions, Mr. Paulson, Dr. Paulson. Uh, here's some for you to answer. What real evidence do you have to show the Big Bang, macroevolution. Matter came from nothing, which is what the evolutionist has to believe. What's your best evidence that chemicals, any chemical has ever produced a different kind of chemical, i.e. chemical evolution? What's your best evidence to show that one star has ever formed? That would be st stage three. What is your best evidence to show that life came from non-living matter, i.e. organic evolution? What is your best evidence that any animal has ever produced a fundamentally different kind of animal? If the gulls, getting from a white gull to a black gull that can't breed together, if that's your best evidence, well, then I win. I'd like to see a whole lot better than that. There's still a gull. Um, <clears throat> I collect public school textbooks. I have hundreds of them, okay? Here's the type of thing the kids are exposed to. They're going to say, we have evidence of evolution. They have whole chapters, sometimes whole units on this, sometimes entire courses just about evolution. But look at the stuff they give these kids as evidence. Evidence from fossils, from structure, molecular biology. I could not believe he brought up some of the things he did. We'll get into those in a minute as his evidence for evolution that had been proven wrong years ago. Here's the typical stuff they use. Evidence from fossils, evidence from vestigial structures, embryology. I can't believe you brought that one up. That was proven wrong in 1874. DNA similarities, fossil, similar structure of limbs, the homology argument. We'll sort of deal with that one in a minute. And then oftentimes they'll say, well, there's poor design. Darwin said, if my theory be true, Numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. Well, you're right about that, Charlie. Where are they? Well, even David Ropp, who's a strong believer in evolution, said, In the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard. <laughs> Boy, that's the truth. And some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. <gasps> you're kidding. <laughs> fantasy in our textbooks? Their evidence they use, they say fossils prove evolution. Now, hold on just a minute. Let's, let's, let's put this in a court of law, okay? I'm going to be one of the attorneys, and I'm going to, the, the opposition stands up and says, Your Honor, we have evidence from evolution because we found a fossil. Like he mentioned Archaeopteryx, which, again, I can't believe that one. We'll show about that one in a minute, too. Okay? Here's my proof for evolution. We have a fossil. I'd like to point out the obvious, Your Honor. If you find a fossil in the dirt, all you know is it died. You don't know that it had any kids, do you? You certainly don't know that it had different kids. And how come the fossils in the dirt can do something the animals today cannot do? Animals today can only produce the same kind. Why do you think the fossil in the dirt can do something that the animals today can't do? Why can't it happen long ago and far away and it can't happen today? 
I mean, if ape-like ancestors produced humans, uh, let's have them do it again. I'd like to see it this time. <laughs> Only let's get an observer now. Apes are still having babies, you know. Make another one. Then they're going to say there's evidence from vestigial structures. This one says the appendix is vestigial. The word vestigial means you don't need it anymore. Well, that's just simply baloney. You do need your appendix, okay? The appendix is part of the immune system. And people that have their appendix taken out are much more susceptible to all sorts of diseases. There's all sorts of research on that in the last 10 years. There aren't any vestigial structures. This one says the whale used to walk around. Here's typical stuff the kids are exposed to. Look at the whale's vestigial pelvis. This is what it says in the textbook. The whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from land-dwelling animals. Four-legged land-dwelling animals. Well, just hold on a second. Those bones right there in the abdomen of the whale are anchor points that muscles attach to. And without those muscles and those bones, the whales cannot reproduce. That has nothing to do with walking on land. It has to do with getting more baby whales. And the author that wrote that is either ignorant of his whale anatomy and should not be writing about it, or he's a liar trying to push some kind of theory off on these kids. Is that your best evidence for evolution, a vestigial structure? This one says, humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. <laughs> well, my wife broke hers three and a half months ago, and she's in excruciating pain tonight, three and a half months later. Trust me, you need your tailbone. I was in a debate in North Alabama with the president of the North Alabama Atheist Association. He got up in front of God and everybody and said, folks, we got proof for evolution. The human tailbone, you no longer need it. I said, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, uh, without which you cannot perform some very valuable functions. <clears throat> <laughs> I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, however, Mr. Patterson, if you believe the tailbone is vestigial, I will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. Won't take you but a minute to figure out that's not vestigial. There aren't any vestigial structures. And if there were, that's the opposite of evolution. That's losing something, not gaining something. Then the evidence from uh, DNA similarities. Similar DNA proves the same designer wrote the code, folks. If, we, if God didn't make everything out of the same amino acids, we could only eat each other. God made it so the brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk and churn it and get the yellow butter, and I eat it and get the blonde hair because it's all made from the same amino acids. That's why there's similarities, not because they all have a common ancestor. I mean, a freshman law student in a court of law could tear that one apart, folks. That's not proof for evolution. And be, listen carefully tonight because there is no evidence for any changes above the species level. Now, if you want to believe there is, you're welcome to believe that, but that's not science. That's your religion. And I think if you're going to keep my religion out of the school, we ought to keep your religion out of the school also. Evolution has no business being in the school. Hmm. Oh. Five. I have just begun. <laughs> Dr. Paulson mentioned evidence from development. This is often called the uh, embryology argument. This textbook tells the kids, the similarity between early stages and development of many different animals helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. I, I was surprised, I guess I shouldn't be, but it's brought up in every debate I've ever done, but they, they still don't seem to get the message. This was proven wrong in 1874. Those little folds of skin under the jaw of the human embryo are not gill slits. They develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. They are not gill slits. And they, it, it ought to be criminal to call them gill slits. And any textbook author that puts that, any teacher that teaches that to his kids in school, after he's exposed to the truth, he should be, he should be fined at least or expelled from teaching if he's going to uh, deliberately lie to the kids. Ernst Haeckel, embryology professor at Jena in Germany, at the University of Jena, he read Darwin's book in 1860. He loved it. It converted his whole way of thinking. His lifestyle was changed. Ernst Haeckel taught embryology, the study of embryos. Ernst Haeckel made this drawing right here, similar to the one Dr. Uh, Paulson showed us a moment ago, about the embryos having gill slits and tails. Haeckel made up this entire thing in 1869. He was trying to help Charlie out because Charlie said, we should find evidence for my theory. Ten years later, they had none, so Haeckel made some up. On top are Haeckel's drawings. Underneath are actual photographs of those creatures. Now, either Haeckel is a lousy artist or he is a liar trying to promote some kind of religious worldview. 
Having studied it quite a bit, I'm convinced he was just a liar, that's all. He was actually convicted of fraud by his own university. In 1874, they had a trial, and Haeckel was convicted of fraud. I mean, convicted their own professor. But Haeckel's drawings still appear in textbooks today. They still they appear tonight on the screen. I can't believe this. This concept of embryology, proven wrong a long time ago. Then they're going to say natural selection causes evolution. The fruit fly is often brought up as an example. They nuke these flies and microwave them and x-ray them and get them to have all sorts of mutated babies. They get flies with curled wings. They can't, you know, fly around. <laughs> flies with no wings at all. What do you call that? A crawl? You can't fly. But <laughs> you get all these mutated flies, and every fly they get is worse off than the original fly. And that's proof of how we get ahead. Folks, that's not evolution. It's still a fly. And it's a worse off fly. This one about the peppered moth was proven wrong several years ago. The guy had to glue dead moths to the trees in order to take the picture for your textbook, kids. The peppered moth experiment is baloney. It didn't happen. It didn't work. But it's still in the textbooks. Then the evidence from structure called the homology argument. He mentioned this as one of his evidences for evolution, his uh, lines of reasoning. Similar forelimb structures in the human, the cat, the whale, the horse, etc. It's true. There's a similar design in the forelimb. I don't argue with that. I agree. I taught biology for years. But similar structure proves a common designer. It doesn't prove a common ancestor. And if you were in a court of law and you brought this up as evidence for evolution, I'm telling you, a freshman law student would point, poke the holes in this one say, excuse me, Your Honor, this doesn't prove we had a common ancestor. Couldn't it prove the same guy designed everything? I could point out that the lug nuts on a Chevy will screw onto a Pontiac. It doesn't prove they both evolved from a Honda 21 million years ago. <laughs> the same guys are designing them, folks. And I could probably point out that the, if you looked at the code of Microsoft Windows as opposed to Microsoft PowerPoint, you'd find billions of similarities. Probably spell check is exactly the same in both programs. Because they're coming from the same designers, that's why. It's time. I got more. <laughs> Thank you. Please, well, Dr. Paulson can begin. So, I have 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Well, you can probably tell that Dr. Hovind's given his presentation hundreds of times, thousands of times. Is this still on? And this is the first time I've spoken publicly about evolution. But, uh, so he's got some good jokes. But unfortunately in science, truth is not determined by who can tell the best jokes. So uh, we have to look at evidence. Uh, Mr. Hovind, I mean Dr. Hovind, has... Uh, to be quite frank, he's made a lot of false and misleading statements, and I would like to be able to rebut them all, but I don't think I can do it in 10 minutes. I couldn't even write them down as fast as he was saying them. I told you at the beginning that my goal for tonight was to teach you something about science. And I think I can, come, I can claim to have some experience to do this because I've been doing research for 28 years almost. And probably the most important lesson, which I hope I've impressed upon you, is that science is not just a body of knowledge, it's a method. It's a process, the scientific method, and I told you about forming hypotheses, testing them, and so forth. What I told you on the slides was obviously just an outline of all the deductions and predictions and evidence that has been put forward. Dr. Hovind will cite one small piece of evidence and say, this is all they got. But that one small piece of evidence is just an example. There are libraries full of reports, research reports, that back up all these things. As I showed you, there were some tough tests that that evolution has been put to. We can't show that a dinosaur turned into a bird, 
because it took millions of years and we can't wind the clock back. Maybe Dr. Hovind seems to expect that we ought to be able to do that. Nobody says, evolution doesn't say that you can see a dinosaur turn into a bird or a lizard turn into a mammal before your very eyes. It takes a long time and people went around then. So it has to be inferred from other kinds of evidence. And that's why we do this scientific approach. That's the way to learn about things that you can't observe directly. He might just as well question what we know about the stars, about the sun. Nobody's ever been to the sun. How do they know there's helium there? But there are ways to test these things indirectly. You don't have to go to the sun to find out its composition. You can use the methods of physics and chemistry and analyze the light and the other radiation from the sun. Dr. Hoven has ignored or belittled most of the points that I made, but I can assure you that none of his arguments would stand up to scrutiny if we had time to scrutinize them. Let me come back to his arguments a little later, but first, let's look at his hypothesis. Did he make one example of a prediction made by the, the hypothesis of creationism? One, even one prediction that would distinguish it from evolution. He predicted that there would be fossils. So what? Evolution predicts that too. Did he show one way that it could conceivably be disproved? Well, maybe I missed it, but uh, I don't think it was there. So he hasn't put his hypothesis to the test. Evolution has been put to the test many times for the last 150 years. And despite what he says, it hasn't been disproved. Creationists could put their theory to the test. I can suggest some experiments he could do. Uh, Dr. Hovind has this fairy tale about how the fossils were all laid down in the Great Flood. Of course, he never comes up with any explanation of where all the water came from, where it went, where all the mud came from, how it turned into rock instantaneously, how the intrusions of granite into the sedimentary rocks formed instantaneously. There's so much granite around the world. We know that granite forms at 1,000 degrees Celsius. That's when it solidifies. The granite that's in the Earth today intruded into sedimentary rocks, presumably must have formed after the uh, flood, after the rocks were laid down. You can calculate that all the heat in those granite rocks would have been so much, all the heat released by cooling those rocks would have been so much that the oceans would have been boiling. At least it solves the problem of how Noah fed those 20,000 species of terrestrial plants, sorry, terrestrial animals and uh, reptiles, birds, and animals. He fed them boiled fish. So, he could test his hypothesis, for example, by looking at coprolites or by looking at tree pollen. His hypothesis predicts that dinosaurs and uh, modern plants were on the earth at the same time. And so, in the coprolites, which are fossilized dinosaur dung, you should predict, his theory would predict, that modern, the pollen of modern plants should be in there. But it never is. Of course, the uh, creationists know that, that their predictions won't be confirmed if they're too tough, so they don't do any experiments. A side effect of doctors, uh, Dr. Hovind's uh, uh, trying to avoid having his hypothesis tested is that he goes through some amazing mental contortions to explain away the data that's staring him right in the face. And all these, uh, it, it's kind of hard to even begin to, to list them all. S so many of these things uh, that he comes up with, uh, all the fossils being laid down in the flood. There are so many fossils 
in the rocks of the world. The, the sedimentary layers are, on average, miles thick, and the number of fossils is so great that if they were all alive at the same time, well, there wouldn't have been any standing room for Noah to build his ark. In fact, the animals would have been piled on top of each other. So those kinds of things just doesn't make sense. He comes up with a good answer to every little thing, but altogether they don't add up to anything. Uh, sorry, I don't know what caused that. Dr. Hovind says that evolution is a faith. Well, it's absolutely clear that creationism is not science. There's no evidence for Dr. Hovind's creationist hypothesis. And if you don't believe me, you can check out the public record of McLean versus the uh, Arkansas Board of Education. Dr. Hovind says, in a court of law, scientific evidence wouldn't stand up, uh, which happens to be false. In, the, in that trial, the top creation scientists in the world were brought in and asked under oath, under cross-examination, what's the evidence for your theory? And they said, well, of course, they had to tell the truth. They were under oath, so they said there isn't any. So, I just want to mention two other things. The big problem that it all comes down to is that Dr. Hovind has made up his mind that his interpretation of the Bible has got to be literally and absolutely true. He puts his own in interpretation of the Bible ahead of the truth. He puts his own ideas on a pedestal and worships them instead of God. Creationism is a dumbing down of God. Creationism says that well, he's always using the argument that if he can't explain something, he'll say, well, God can do anything, so God could have, done, could have put the fossils in the rocks or whatever. God could have made the, the light from the distant stars getting here, even though they're more than 6,000 light years away. Of course, that means that these star explosions that he uh, referred to never really happened. They were just... Um, they never really happened because they're more than 6,000 years away. So, there's one thing that he says God could not have done. He says that God could not have created a world where creatures evolve into different kinds or whatever they are. He never tells us what a kind is, so I'm afraid I can't respond to the, whether kinds can change. I guess if I could, could show that they change he would revamp his definition. So, in conclusion, I want to say that uh, we need evolution in our schools because it forms the basis for modern science and medicine. There is so much research going on on model organisms like yeast that should have no applicability to humans if there's no relationship between the two. But it is. Valuable advances have come from that. Applying evolutionary theory to the study of influenza virus has led to predictive ability to show how flu is going to change so we can make better vaccines. Those are just examples. But in conclusion, if we don't teach our students about evolution, there's no way that they can understand modern biology or medicine. Thank, Thank you. you. Is it okay? We will, now, we will now enter into a question and answer period which will last approximately one hour. We will give each um, individual two minutes to respond to the question. The first question, we'll start with Dr. Hovind. What does the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, um, help to conclude? The question is, what does the second law of thermodynamics, entropy, help to conclude? 
There are three laws of thermodynamics. Uh, the first one basically boiled down says something to the effect that matter cannot, matter slash energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be changed. The second law is a corollary of that, which says that uh, in any exchange, uh, things become less ordered. There's something lost in every exchange. When you burn gasoline, there's an awful lot of it wasted as heat. About 30% goes to turn your wheels, and the rest is lost as heat, irretrievably lost. But since every, every known exchange uh, leads toward more disorder, the obvious conclusion is that the universe is winding down, and therefore there must have been a beginning. Typically, the evolutionist response will be that uh, this only takes place in a closed system. Well, I'd like to point out the universe is a closed system, unless you want to speculate some uh, uh, outside energy source outside the universe. They'll say, well, the sun supplies energy to the earth. Well, yes, I know, and it's 100% destructive unless there's a very complex mechanism to utilize this energy called chlorophyll. Uh, filling your front seat full of gasoline will not make your car run faster. You have to have a complex mechanism to utilize that energy, called a carburetor system and a drivetrain, engine transmission, etc. So the, to, to argue that uh, second law of thermodynamics can be overcome in an open system by adding energy is ridiculous. Adding energy only works if there's a very complex mechanism to utilize the energy. The sun will eventually bake the paint off your car, destroy the roof of your house, break up the concrete in your driveway. It's 100% destructive to everything on earth except chlorophyll. So before life is here, very complex life, uh, the evolutionist is really at a brick wall as far as explaining. The second law of thermodynamics is, is evidence there had to be a beginning and there will be an end, an ultimate heat death, and it could not have uh, created itself. Time up. Do I have a minute? Two minutes? I didn't quite follow that answer, but... Uh, the second law of thermodynamics does say that there's a difference, and it's, what it says is different from what the creationists usually say. The second law of thermodynamics does say that uh, in a closed system, disorder increases, and living things are not closed systems, and that's why in living things, disorder can decrease. If Dr. Hoven doesn't know the difference between an open system and a closed system, I suggest he make himself into a closed system right now. Uh, stop eating, drinking, and breathing. Uh, and about 10 minutes from now, we'll check back and see if his disorder has increased. <laughs> it will. But the point is, disorder can decrease. Order can increase. It happens all the time whenever any living thing grows because it's taking in energy and food from its environment. And this has nothing to do with whether or not evolution could have occurred or not. In fact, it could have occurred because, the, uh, uh, because order can increase and when energy goes in. And as he said, we get energy from the sun. I'll stop there. Next question is directed for Dr. Paulson. Um, simple question. Uh, please explain the dating procedure of the geologic column. This is from Eric. Okay, the dating procedure of a geologic column. Um, I'm not a geologist, but from what I know, the geologic column was put together in the early 1800s, before Darwin. It was based on the observations of the guys who were building the canals around Britain, and they discovered that the in the cutaways for the canals, the same layers of rock were seen everywhere. Uh, and that had some practical usefulness for them because some layers of rock were more porous and they didn't want to cut into those when they were doing the canals. So they studied this and uh, figured out the layers, the different layers in the different parts of the country and how they corresponded. They also noticed that there were fossils in these layers and that some of them were, and that the fossils were found in the same, the, the fossils were distinctive for the layers. So the geologic column was putting together all these layers. Now, not all the layers occur in every place, because not every place was building rock throughout the whole history of the Earth, and some of the rocks have, have eroded somewhere along the way. But they could be put together, and that was before the theory of evolution came along, Later, it became clear why there were the different changes in the fossils in the different layers 
uh, because evolution had taken place. And much later still, radioactive dating came into play, and that confirmed the relative ages. If all those rocks were laid down in the flood, it's quite astonishing that they formed such nice layers and that the ratios of radioactive elements just happened in all the layers to fit the uh, older to younger uh, pattern. I give a very long answer to this question on my video number four, uh, or you can get on my website, drdino.com, and get a long answer. He's right about the history of the geologic column, developed in the 1800s. Uh, Charles Lyell's the primary fellow in 1830 uh, with his book, but uh, they gave each layer of rock a different name, an age, and an index fossil. The geologic column is actually the Bible for the evolutionist. Everything must be interpreted in light of this geologic column. It can only be found one place in the world, that is in the textbooks. The geologic column does not exist, and they know that. If there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. There are a few places where you can find the index fossils in some kind of order that they, that they uh, have arranged, but that doesn't prove the geologic column exists anywhere. These layers of strata, like you see in Grand Canyon, all form very quickly. There are no erosion marks between the layers. If that layer sat there for 10 million years waiting for the next one to come on top, don't you think it'd rain at once or twice in 10 million years? I mean, there are no erosion marks between these layers. The geologic column all took place during the flood. I don't have time to cover all the uh, information we have on this, but geologic column is based on circular reasoning. Um, circular reasoning is where you use the fossils to date the layers, then you turn around and use the layers to date the fossils. This is exactly how it's done. I'll show you from their own mouth here. Um, page. 306 of Earth Science or Glencoe Biology textbook says you date the rocks by the fossils. On page 307, it tells the students to date the fossils by the rocks. The intelligent layman has long suspected circular reasoning and the use of rocks to date fossils and fossils to date rocks. The geologist has never bothered to think of a good reply. There is no good reply. They're arguing in a circle. I'll just take a few more here. By the way, radiometric dating is not possible without the geologic column. The evolutionists themselves understand that. Uh, let's see, how about this one? The rocks do date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> it's based on circularity, folks. I'll show you that it's not correct. Petrified trees are frequently found standing up, and I'll show you some pictures of them here, so I don't tell you exactly what I'm saying here. Uh, lobe fin done? fish, we cover all Thank this in great detail in video number. One minute. I went past it. Petrified trees standing up running through multiple layers in the geologic column. I have been to many places where these trees are. Petrified trees standing up, running through multiple layers, are proof positive those layers are not different ages. Past time? Okay. <laughs> this next question does go for you. Doc. We'll start with you, Dr. Hoven. You seem to be refuting single-step evolution. What do you have to say about cumulative evolution? I would say uh, there is no cumulative evolution. It's all, it takes place in the imagination. They would like to believe that it happens if you give it billions of years, but there is no proof that it's happened. If you ask an evolutionist, you know, if, this really, if, if we really came about by gradual changes, why do we see no kinds of animals changing today? Would you please give me your best example of a transitional form alive today? Lots of animals are still having babies. I mean, let's see one today, okay? If they say, well, we don't live long enough to see this change, okay, well, then let's see one in the fossil record. Archaeopteryx is a lousy example. First place, it's not a missing link. It's a bird. It's a 100% bird, a perching bird with uh, toes that uh, one toe goes backwards to grab the tree branches. I'll prove that if you'd like, if I get a minute. But uh, Absolutely 100% modern birds are found in rock layers that they date at 130 to 140 million years old, which is way before dinosaurs went extinct. So he said several times tonight that dinosaurs turned to birds, and I'm telling you folks, even by their ge geologic column, the birds were already here 130 million years ago. And I've got the evidence for that in a different presentation. It'll take me a minute to find that, but it didn't happen. There is no evidence whatsoever for this macroevolution. It only takes place, you have to imagine that it happened. And I'm sure we'll get a response like, well, we see these little changes, and if we had long enough time, time is the hero to the plot. And I'm telling you, it doesn't help, okay? Everything falls apart with time. It doesn't get better. Thank you. 
let me address a couple of the uh, false statements that Dr. Herman has just made. He said that Archaeopteryx was 100% bird. That's absolutely not true. Archaeopteryx has many characteristics of reptiles and not of birds. In fact, most of its skeletal properties are those of reptiles. Claws at the end of the, at the, end of the arms or wings. Teeth. Bony tail. Find me a bird that has those and then I'll admit that it's 100% bird, but until then, uh, he says that dinosaurs couldn't have come into couldn't have evolved into birds because the birds were there before the dinosaurs were gone. Well, so what? There were dinosaurs there 200 million years ago, uh, and some of them evolved into birds 140 million years ago. Other dinosaurs were still there. So what? Let me use the rest of my time to just uh, point out that the so-called circular argument about the geologic column is totally false. The geologic column was not based on fossils originally. It was not based on evolution. He may have managed to find some really bad textbooks to quote, but no scientist based, no, no geologist would tell you that the geologic column is based on evolution. It was there before evolution was even thought of. Um, going back to starting with again, uh, Professor Paulson, the uh, question um, simple, simply, how does evolution explain symbiotic relationships? And by that, I take it that uh, they're talking about uh, relationships such as the honeybee and uh, uh, f uh, flowers that are utilized by the honeybee, um, to totally different separate okay. species. I'll, I'll give an example. Um, uh, again, I'm not an ecologist, so I don't know specific examples. But there is one example of an insect and a cactus, I think it is, that, uh, uh, that are totally dependent on one another. The cactus needs the insect for pollination. The insect needs the cactus for food. And the argument of the creationists is, well, how could they have evolved? Because if you took either one away, they wouldn't, make a, uh, they wouldn't be able to survive. But all you have to think about is that in the past, some point in the past, there may have been several uh, insects that fed on that cactus and several different plants on which that insect, um, sorry, several different insects that could pollinate that cactus, and several different plants on which that particular insect could survive. But with time, some of the other plants and insects died out. The, that cactus changed gradually so that it became more dependent on just that insect, and that insect became more dependent on just that plant. So there's no contradiction. In fact, those are good examples of how uh, evolution can work. OK, I think this is, illustrates clearly what I said earlier. Um, you have to imagine that evolution happened. It could have been, might have been. You know, go back and play the tape uh, when, you, when you get it. Uh, that's all they have, folks, is speculation. All you have to do is imagine there might have been another insect. Of course, we don't have any proof of this. This is my point exactly. Evolution is a religion. You have to believe in these things. There's certainly no evidence for it. The fact is we do have an enormous number of symbiotic relationships. Termites cannot digest cellulose. They can only chew it up and swallow it. The critters that live in their intestines digest the cellulose. Now, those little critters cannot live outside of the termite, and the termite cannot live without those critters. So which one evolved first, and how did it survive without the other one? You'd have to go through all sorts of imagination of how, well, it might have done a different purpose, might have something else. Okay, you can imagine all you want, but this is my point. You're outside of science at that point. And just because a person has really good science in some areas does not mean he doesn't frequently try to sneak his religious worldview in with his science. And that's what's happened. That's what happens in all the universities, and it's tragic. And somebody ought to put a stop to it. I'm working on it as hard as I can. Uh, <laughs> And again, the hero, hero to the plot was time, as if time is going to do it. Do I have, how much time do I have left? 
We're leaving an awful lot of stuff hanging here, and I'd love to go back, and I've been accused of being a liar about ten times tonight. I'd love to go back and get a specific example and stay on just one. But this, this article says, Dinosaurs are alive as birds. USA Today, October 99. Dinosaurs, they found a new missing link. National Geographic, new missing link. Proof for evolution. A couple months later, oops, sorry, it's a fraud. <laughs> this stuff happens all the time. Okay, we can go through this at lunch if you'd like. Textbook says, Dinosaurs turn to birds. There we go. Alan Fiducia, one of the world authorities on birds, said at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, he said, paleontologists have tried to turn Archaeopteryx into an earthbound feathered dinosaur, which is what you're trying to do tonight, but it's not. It's a bird, a perching bird, and no amount of paleo babble is going to change that. Archaeopteryx had... Time is up. Watch video number four to get the rest of it. <laughs> this next question again is for you, Dr. Hoven. If you believe that the universe was created 6,000 years ago, how do you explain rocks dating back millions and billions of years? Doesn't carbon dating prove millions of years? Uh, I've had this one open three times, hoping we'd get to this, and now here we are. It's going to take me a minute to get there. I cover this in great detail on my website or video number seven about carbon dating. Carbon dating, I wish we had two hours to go through how it works. I'm very familiar with it. I, um, it doesn't work at all, uh, and I'll show you why. Um, based on several obvious assumptions, and a freshman law student can take it apart in, 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 in the courtroom. Living mollusk shells, carbon dated 2,300 years old. Science Magazine, Volume 144. Freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. Antarctic Journal, Volume 6. Shells from living snails, carbon dated 27,000 years old. One part of a mammoth, carbon dated 29,000 years old. Another part dated 44,000 years old. <laughs> Geological Survey, professional paper, 862. Baby edema, carbon dated. One part was 40,000, another part's 26,000, and the wood next to it is 9,000. The lower leg of a mammoth, carbon dated 15,000 years old. The skin was 21,000 years old. Two mammoths side by side gave ages of 22,000 and 16,000. Living penguins dated 8,000 years old. They had, in Berkeley, California, the most advanced dating center we have... Came to, tried to date Homo erectus fossils. They thought it would be 250,000. They kept, he kept making the same startling find. Swisher said the fossils are 53,000 years at most and 27,000 years old, at least. What I'd like to point out, Your Honor, that's a 96% error. I think this is a little bit less than an exact science. It's time. <laughs> okay. I'm not familiar with all these examples that Dr. Hoven is pulling up, but I am familiar with one of them because it's one that's been repeated many times by creationists and it's totally misleading. There are indeed snails that have been dated, uh, living snails, which have been dated to 3,000 years old. But there are times when radiocarbon dating is not uh, applicable. Radiocarbon dating assumes that the carbon in the organism came from the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, the amount of carbon-14 is fairly constant because cosmic rays are hitting the atmosphere and converting uh, uh, nitrogen into carbon-14. But those snails picked up their, their carbon from carbonate rocks that had dissolved into the stream where they were living. And because of that, uh, the carbonate rocks were very old, and the carbon that was in the carbonate rocks uh, was very deficient in carbon-14 compared to carbon dioxide that's in the air. Uh, and that's why those snails appeared to be very old. In fact, carbon dating has been applied to tree rings, and the correspondence between uh, the tree rings and the carbon dates has been shown to be very accurate. It's actually, uh, the, the expected error is about 10% because the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere seems to vary, uh, and it has been shown to vary over the last 100, 100 years or so based on, uh, uh, it, it varies and it's correlated with uh, activity on the sun, which is correlated with the amount of cosmic rays. In fact, carbon-14 is not used for dating rocks at all. It's only used for dating things less than 50,000 years old, 
Uh, it's the carbon-14 half-life is too short to use for dating uh, longer things. And so the other elements that I mentioned back in the beginning of my presentation are used for dating rocks. Um, the next question is uh, for both uh, speakers. Um, either one of you can start, whoever would like to go first. The question is, right now science is arguing the evidence of design. What is the nature of this argument and importance of design in this discussion? Okay. If I understand, the question is, what is the importance of the argument from design? You know, things appear to be designed. Uh, I would say it's real simple. There was a designer. <laughs> and I happen to know him personally. Uh, the argument from design is, uh, was Paley's argument that frustrated Darwin for years, and Darwin in his book, uh, The Origin of Species, where he never did really address the origin of species. I've got the book out in the car. I'm sorry I was late. I didn't have time to set everything up here tonight. But uh, the argument from design is, is as yet unanswered. If you find a 15-inch rim and a 15-inch tire, you would assume the tire was designed to fit the rim. And they are, of course. Uh, we find billions of examples in the world where things are obviously designed for what they do. The evolutionist has this enormous amount of faith, and I do really greatly admire their faith, to believe that these things could happen by chance. Well, again, you're welcome to believe that, but that's not science. That's your religious belief. Now, people hold that to hold to that religious belief for various different reasons. We could get into that if you'd like, but the fact is it's not scientific. It looks to be everything's designed. And you don't have to see the designer to believe he exists. I've got a watch made in Japan, Casio Data Bank, holds 300 phone numbers. Calculator, stopwatch, countdown timer, does not tell time. You have to look at it. But this is really an amazing machine. I don't have to see the designer to believe he exists. I've never been to Japan. I can look, I can stand here in America and say, wow, that guy must be smart. That's logical. I can look at a single cell under the microscope, and one cell is more complex than the space shuttle. And I can say, wow, the designer must be really smart. That's just logical. It had to be a designer. I think what the question is referring to as the argument from design is a recent uh, thing that comes out of, of uh, discoveries in, in physics and so forth that the universe is very finely tuned to make life possible. Uh, supposedly if the, some of the basic constants of carbon atoms were just a little bit different, not enough carbon would have uh, uh, formed in the centers of stars long ago uh, to even make life possible. There's an assumption, which I must say I don't like, in what Dr. Hovind says. There's an assumption that someone who believes in evolution does not believe in God. But that is not true. I believe that there's a designer and that he made the universe as a whole. Not every little worm and every little bacterium, but made the universe as a whole with laws that would let it keep going on its own. And that's basically something that, uh, it's a faith based on the, in part on this argument from design, but also just from an understanding of life and a sense of spirituality. And so, believing in evolution doesn't mean you don't believe in God, it just means you don't believe in the narrow view of God that says God created the world 6,000 years ago. The next question is for, is for Dr. Hoven. We are able to witness star evolution. In the space, there are tons of matter, gas, and particles. Those particles form in star-forming regions, nebulas, and we are able to see that as well as the evolution and death of stars. How can you say that solar evolution is not science, that it is religion? We are able to look at that. The example the person gave there is uh, we can see the evolution of stars, we can see solar death. We see stars destroyed, we see stars blow up. It's called a nova or a supernova. There's no question there's an awful lot of stars out there. The Bible says God made the stars. And the argument, Dr. Paulson, I agree, I, I don't think that a person who believes in evolution doesn't believe in God. I'll just say you don't believe in the same God that I believe in. 
the God that I believe in can make it right first time. He doesn't need to practice or play around. Okay? I wouldn't worship a God as retarded as one that has to use blind random chance to get us here. I think he did it right first time. Okay. Uh, I think all we see from stars is the opposite of evolution. Examples of things breaking or falling down. As far as how we see the distance to the stars, that was brought up earlier. That's one of the 14 points I have left hanging here. I cover that very thoroughly on video number seven, calculating the distance to stars. Uh, the idea that starlight is consistently the same speed, or that light is the same. They need to read what was done at Harvard two months ago in February. Uh, they slowed light down to one mile per hour in the laboratory. Um, last year they had slowed it down to 38 miles an hour. Check uh, Dr. Howe, H-A-U, at Harvard University where they've done all this. But I go through calculating distance to stars. Everything I see from the stars proves the second law of thermodynamics. They're breaking down. They're burning out. They're falling apart. If red giant stars turn into white dwarf stars, that's the opposite of evolution. That's losing, not gaining. I'd like to see one example of any star forming or one example of any star improving in its complexity. I mean, obviously, they're burning up. I mean, where did they, how, how did they start is the question. That's all. And there's no evidence that they could have. All the evidence says they had to be created instantly, or had to be created at least, because they're all burning out. So how did it start is the obvious unanswered question from the evolutionist perspective. The question, the question I believe was about evolution of stars. I didn't say anything in my presentation about uh, anything except biological evolution, but among astronomers, there is a very well-developed theory of star evolution. We can't see stars evolve because it takes time, but we can infer uh, things, and we can make tests of hypotheses, just like we can do with biological evolution. I want to make a comment about one thing that Dr. Hoven said. He said he didn't believe in a God that relied on chance to get us here. I don't see anything wrong with chance. When parents have a child, they leave it up to chance what that child is going to be like. And yet they love that child just as much as if they had planned it, maybe more. Why can't it be the same with God? to create the universe at the beginning and let us come into being. He didn't create us specifically, but we are in existence by his will. So I don't think you can argue against chance. And in fact, any other argument is going to lead you to determinism. If you think that you are here entirely by, it was determined that you're going to be here, then it couldn't be that you have any free will. If you don't have any free will, then morality, love, faith, none of those things mean anything. The chance aspect is important. God had to give us freedom to make choices in order to make life meaningful. That's all. Um, starting with Dr. Paulson, a question is, are there any examples of non-life evolving into life? I, did you say non-life developing into life? Okay. Uh, I think the answer is no, but the... Um, <laughs> I'm assuming you mean the answer, I'm assuming you mean in the laboratory. Um, but the hypothesis that life originated, I, I didn't talk about this because I believe it's a separate issue and it, it complicates things because the hypothesis that living things came into existence uh, from non-living matter by natural means uh, is obviously much less well developed than the theory of change of species that I talked about. But still, the hypothesis that living things came into being from non-living matter can be tested. It, ha it makes predictions that can be tested. And it's, it's certainly not proven. It's not even well established. But it has made some predictions that were quite surprising, which have turned out to be true and quite useful. For example, that hypothesis predicted the existence of 
it would take too long to explain why, but it predicted the existence of molecules that have both the properties of genes and catalysts. In other words, it predicted that RNA molecules would serve as catalysts, uh, and that was subsequently found to be the case. It makes other predictions as well uh, about the existence of self-replicating molecules, uh, and there's been some progress along those lines. So it's not uh, an unreasonable hypothesis by any means. It certainly has not been disproven. I think it has been disproven as far as the origin of life. There have been numerous experiments to try to create life in the laboratory. Students are taught, like this textbook says, many important events occurred during the Archean era, the most important of which was the evolution of life. Progress from complex molecules to even the simplest living organism was a very long process. This one says, the first living cells emerged between 4 billion and 3.8 billion years ago. There is no record of the event. The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. What they did in the laboratory, Miller and Urey and many people since then have tried to make life in the laboratory by circulating methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen through some tubes with a lightning spark in there to simulate lightning in the early atmosphere. This is all fictitious, but this is what they think, okay? This textbook tells the kids, he made a mixture that was rich in amino acids. Talk about propaganda. <laughs> That's propaganda at its best. He didn't make life. He didn't even come close. He excluded oxygen from his experiment because he knew the presence of oxygen would break down any amino acids. It would be oxidized. So they purposely excluded oxygen. The problem with that is, if you don't have oxygen, you don't have ozone, and ozone blocks UV light, and UV light destroys ammonia. And that was one of his gases. So life cannot evolve without oxygen to protect the ammonia. The other problem is, the Earth has always had oxygen. The lowest rocks in the layers prove that. And he filtered out the product in his experiment. That's not realistic for us, what would happen in nature. What he made was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. Both are toxic to life. You make a mixture that's 98% deadly to what you're trying to produce, I don't think you could call that a success. He produced basically two of the amino acids. It takes 20. The amino acids bond quickly with tar and acid. They will not bond with each other as fast as they will with the tar and acid. If we had an hour, we'd go through all this. He did not make life in the laboratory. What he made was a problem because they proved that it can't be done. Amino acids will unbond in water much faster than they bond, and the oceans are completely full of water all the way to the top. <laughs> and Brownian, Brownian motion is going to drive them away from each other. It's, it's not going to put them together. He Thank did you. not make life in the laboratory. They've never even come close. All the experiments Thank have you. shown us that there must have been a designer, an origin of this. This question, again, for you, Doctor. We'll start with you, Dr. Hoven. You kept talking about kind. What about the chosen, uh, excuse me, the closer similarities of the dolphin in a shark that you see by stepping back 30 feet, when in fact the DNA and protein evidence shows that the dolphin and mouse are more similar? How can you explain this? I would explain the dolphin and mouse similarity. First of all, if a person says the dolphin and mouse are more similar in their DNA, I would like to ask exactly what are you examining? Because if you look at cytochrome C, you'll find that the human's closest, answer, closest relative is a sunflower. If you look at the eyes, our closest ancestor is an octopus. It depends on who's doing the examining and what you're trying to compare, and, what, and also what point you're trying to prove. I think that the mouse and the dolphin are both mammals. They both breathe air above water, so that's a similarity. Uh, that's a common sense that a designer would do that. As far as the DNA sequencing proving anything, if I had time, if I give me a warning on the question, I can call up a bunch of pictures on this. Uh, watch video number four. Uh, <laughs> I think it, the DNA is so complex. I mean, it's unbelievably complex. One DNA molecule is beyond comprehension in its complexity. Just the DNA found in one cell in your body right now is much greater than all the computer programs ever written in the history of man combined. That's all found in one cell in your body. So to think that this happened by chance is just fairy tale stuff. Now, I don't object to anybody believing in that. You can believe in the Tooth Fairy, Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, evolution. I don't care what you believe in. But don't call it science and don't make me pay to put it in the schools. That's all I'm saying. They ought to keep that stuff at home or start a private school and teach evolution to those that want to pay and come learn it. That would be fair. How many minutes was that? How many minutes was that? Uh... Seemed like more. <laughs> okay, DNA similarity is something that can be measured. 
DNA similarity means you take a long sequence of DNA from one organism and a long sequence from another, and you line them up, and you see how many differences there are. It's actually more complicated than that, but uh, there are ways to do it. And the, the, you can measure the distance between do two DNA molecules as the, basically the number of changes or mutations that would be necessary to change one into the other. Uh, now, you might be interested to know that apes and humans have DNA where 99 out of every 100 subunits of the DNA are the same. Now, it would be interesting to ask uh, Dr. Hovind um, which one was made in the image of the other because uh, that amount of similarity is pretty suspicious if they were created independently. If two of my students brought term papers in and I looked through them and I found that of 1,000 words, 990 were the same, I would begin to suspect a little bit of uh, plagiarism. But in, uh, in evolution, it makes sense that related, more similarly related organisms will have um, more similar DNA. And that's exactly what we find. And it's consistent across all the parts of the DNA. Now, I don't know what he was saying about cytochrome C of sunflowers and humans. Uh, that sounds like it's at odds with everything I've read. The octopus eye is not at all similar to the human eye. It has the retina, uh, the retina and the um, uh, and the nerves the opposite way around from what human eyes have. And so the octopus and human eyes are not uh, evidence for a common designer by any means. Thank you. I will start again with you, Dr. Paulson. How do you explain the relationship of apes and humans to the Neanderthals? Isn't it true that living things evolve to meet their ecosystem? Organisms can evolve from rocks, but live by constant chemical reactions. Yeah, <laughs> sure. How do you explain the relationship of apes and humans to the Neanderthals? Isn't it true that living things evolve to meet their ecosystem? Organisms can't evolve from rocks, but live by constant chemical reactions. Well, there's three questions there. Do I get yeah. six minutes? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I'll just take two, because the second two don't make much sense. Actually, uh, the first one, apes and humans and Neanderthals, uh, Neanderthals, as far as I'm aware, are a uh, are a um, an ancient uh, form of human being, probably still Homo sapiens, that uh, is really very similar to modern man. Uh, mitochondrial DNA from um, Neanderthals has been studied, taken from uh, the bones of Neanderthals. And uh, there's about four times, as, I think it's like four or five times as much difference between the Neanderthals and modern humans as between uh, different groups of modern humans. So the idea is that they were a group that diverged from the main line that led to modern humans uh, some hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, the other thing about evolving from a rock, uh, well, if life evolved from um, non-living matter, then um, obviously some uh, inorganic substances became part of organic living cells. But uh, let's see, I don't quite see what that has to do. What was the second part of that? The rock and the constant chemical reactions or something? Uh, I think I'll just leave that one. I confess I don't understand the question either. Uh, I do have a good part of it. As far as humans and Neanderthals, I think the evidence indicates, even though Neanderthals are presented as part of the evolutionary chain in the typical textbook, 
Um, the evidence from the Neanderthals is that they are just human. They're within the range of humans. They are, they were, the 4% difference that he mentioned is certainly still within the range of humans. Dr. Cuazzo has written a fascinating book on this called Buried Alive. He was one of the few men to actually go study the actual bones. Most people, when they study fossils and learn about evolution, they get to study a copy of the fossil, a, a casting or a replica. You ought to read this book, Buried Alive. You can get it through my ministry or get it through him. He lives in New Jersey. I can get you his phone number if you want. Call him, ask him any questions directly. He's a dentist. He studied the Neanderthals very thoroughly and wrote this very conclusive book about it and said, folks, they're just a human, that most of them had acromegaly, excessive sec secretion of growth hormone in old age. The bones in the forehead start to get thicker. When a person passes 80 or 90 years of age, the forehead starts to thicken, get uh, thick-headed. Uh, <laughs> and he's thinking these people are probably over 100, and uh, they develop slower. He found much evidence of slower, delayed maturation. Today, people mature and are able to produce children when they're 12 and 13. These are probably more like 16 or 18 or 20, delayed maturation. Uh, and it, just a fascinating book answering about the Neanderthals. As far as uh, humans or anything coming from Iraq, that's my whole point. It didn't happen. But ultimately, if you boil away the big words, the evolutionist has to believe we came from Iraq 4.6 billion years ago. I mean, there's no way out of the argument. That's what they believe. They keep trying to hide and say, well, we're only talking about living organisms evolving. Well, then get the rest of the stuff out of the books. Help, join me. Help me get that stuff out of there. That would be a good cause. All right, thank you. We have 10 minutes remaining in our question and answer session, and we'd like to take the opportunity for each doctor to present a question to the other and then allow them two minutes to respond to that. So we'll start with Dr. Paulson, if you'd like to ask um, Dr. Hovind a question. Yeah, get or, we can, get or we can start with the other, either or. Do you have a question? Oh, I've got lots of questions, right. sure. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with you. I still would like to know, you mentioned that there's libraries full of evidence for evolution. Would you please simplify it down? What is the best evidence you know of? You said you studied this for 28 years. What is the best evidence you know of of any kind of animal producing a different kind? You mentioned about the gull, the white and the black gull. Uh, if that is not your best evidence, please tell me what is. Don't just say there's lots of evidence. Just please tell me your best one. Will you tell me first what a kind is? I did. Uh, you may said I didn't give the definition of kind, and I did. I said animals that originally were able to reproduce uh, living viable offspring. And they may have diversified now, where for some reason they're no longer able to reproduce. Great Dane and a Chihuahua. Well, technically they can have a few mechanical problems, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> the biblical created kinds were those that were capable of reproducing a viable offspring, which was also capable of reproducing. So that would be a good definition of kind, at least the best I can come up with on this for the moment. Uh, this is a... Um Quite an amazing thing because these people who call themselves creation scientists have this idea of a kind and they have no idea what it means. Uh, you know, you just can't pin them down. I gave you a good definition for what a species is. It's a group of creatures that can interbreed, a group of animals or plants that can productively interbreed, and that's the definition of, of a species. That's a well-defined uh, concept. There are some difficulties when you have uh, transitions taking place, like the two gulls. But um, let me give my best evidence for this idea. Dr. Hovind's been talking about what? Dogs and bananas? Well, let's talk about dogs and peas, because I don't happen to have any knowledge of data on bananas. But I think if you can show it for peas, you can show it for bananas. Uh, this, and by the way, I haven't studied evolution for 28 years. I've studied biochemistry. Uh, but one of the things I have studied for almost 28 years is proteins that are in chromosomes called histones. And there's one of those called histone H3. There's five of them, five main cla classes altogether. But there's one called histone H3 that is uh, very conserved in evolution. The explanation for this is that it is that it has so many functions, so many parts of the protein, when the protein first originated, probably in the first uh, nucleated cell, when that first happened, it had so many functions 
that it couldn't, no part of it could change, and so it has stayed the same. There's only one difference between mammals and peas. Now, you could say that's due to a sa the same designer. I say it's due to common ancestry way back in the very first uh, nucleated cell, the eukaryotic cell. How can we test which of those is true? Well, the DNA that encodes that protein can change because the genetic code that goes from a DNA to a protein has, there's several different DNAs that can encode the same protein. So, evolution would predict that if you looked at the DNA, even though all organisms, from plants to mammals and everything in between, has almost identical histone H3, you would predict that when you look at the DNA and the similarities in the genes of the histone H3 gene, you would come up with a family tree like the ones I showed you before, and that is what we find. If those were all created, you would predict that one of two things should happen. Either the creator would, if the proteins are all the same, why wouldn't the creator make all the DNAs the same? Uh, well, it might make them, might just choose the codons from the genetic code to use at random, and then there would be no relationship between the DNAs at all. Or they might be chosen so that the same DNA was used in all cases. But you certainly would not predict the pattern that's actually seen. And uh, that, to me, I mean, I haven't, I never formally studied evolution, but I started out as a biochemist and uh, learning about these proteins. And that sort of thing, to me, is so convincing of common ancestry that um, uh, it wouldn't matter if there were fossils or not. Okay, Dr. Paulson. Okay. We just got five minutes left, and that uh, would give your opportunity for a question to Dr. Hoven. Okay, I guess I'd like to pin Dr. Hoven down one more time on the idea of what predictions his hypothesis makes, and I'd like to sh him to share with us one prediction that the hypothesis of creation makes, hypothesis of creationism, 6,000 years ago and all that, one prediction that would distinguish it from evolution, one case where it makes a different prediction, and secondly, a prediction by which it could conceivably be falsified. Well, you kind of did what that other guy did. You asked about five questions. Uh, <laughs> just give me one. Uh, narrow that down to one for me. Can you try one more time? Because I've only got five minutes to answer this. Uh, pick one. Which one do you like the worst? Just show me a prediction that distinguishes creationism from evolution. Creation predicts that animals will bring forth after their kind. And if you look around the world in all the breeding experiments um, and accidents, that's all we're seeing, is they're bringing forth after their kind. I gave you my predictions. There's going to be animals that produce after their kind and plants that produce after their kind. There will be no uh, intermediates between basic kinds. I gave you a definition of kind, capable of reproducing. Uh, your definition of species was interesting, that uh, is similar to my definition of kind, animals capable of reproducing, and yet a dog and a wolf are a different species. But they can interbreed, you know, so you don't have a good definition of species, I, I don't think, either. Um, and again, we're arguing back, back to between micro and macro. Where's the borderline? That's, where the, that's what the whole argument is about here. Where's the line between micro and macro evolution? I don't know exactly the definition of all the kinds, but I think the vast majority are pretty obvious, and a three-year-old can tell you, that a banana and a dog are a different kind of animal. So my prediction would be that animals would only be observed to bring forth after their kind, and that fossils we would find would be similar to living fossils today, li living animals today, or plants, and that there will be no evidence whatsoever in the living world or in the dead world of anything in between basic kinds of animals. That's what I predict based upon the creation model, and we have yet to see any evidence to the contrary of that. I predict, for, for, for one thing, fossils don't form very readily. Millions of buffalo were slaughtered out west in the last few hundred years. I defy you to go find one fossilized buffalo. The existence of fossils, period, is very good evidence of a flood. Soft-bodied animals like worms and jellyfish are found fossilized. 
had to be buried instantly. They'd have been decayed or scavenged in a few, you know, you know, in a few moments down in the ocean in the real world. So the existence of fossils in twisted, contorted positions and disarticulated fossils where they rotted for a few months and then were finally buried in giant piles of bones. We cover that in video number six of my series about all the fossil graveyards are such powerful proof for a flood. So I gave you my predictions that we'll find animals that only produce after their kind in the living and we won't find fossils of anything in between. And uh, we'll find zillions of fossils buried in the ground. As far as something that would falsify that, well, then the opposite. If we don't find any fossils buried in the ground then probably that's good evidence there wasn't a flood. Uh, if, we don't, if we find animals regularly producing different kinds other than themselves, wildly different kinds, that are also capable of reproducing, that would be good evidence. That would falsify the creation uh, theory. And yet we, I'd like to see those. There is none of that. There's no evidence for that. All right. If, if each of you would like to make a closing statement, a brief closing statement on your behalf, we would take those now. How long will that be? Two minutes? Uh, oh. We won't time you. As long as you want. Somewhat well. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, I'm glad I'm going first. <laughs> well, I would just like to reply to uh, the question the answer, rather, to my question that Dr. Hoven just gave, uh, I understood him to say that if that his uh, hypothesis of creationism predicts that all the fossils in the ground would be the same as fossils that are alive today. That sounded like what he said. He certainly said... Uh, something about there not being any transitional fossils between the groups that are alive today. Uh, and when he tells you that there aren't, uh, he is quite simply ignoring lots of paleontological work and lots of fossils that have been discovered. They're out there, and uh, the thing that makes evolution science, one of the things that makes evolution science is that when people make claims, other people can check them out. Those fossils are, are there in museums and laboratories, you know, so people can uh, check them from themselves. And uh, they are some that are clearly transitional. So that would tend to disprove creationism, if that's a really uh, firm prediction of it, that those shouldn't exist. He also says that creationism predicts that there should be zillions of fossils. Well, he hasn't answered my point about uh, there being too many fossils. There's one rock formation, I believe it's called the Kalu Formation in Africa, which is uh, by test drillings and so forth, has been estimated to contain 800 uh, billion fossils of animals, average size of a fox. Now, you can calculate out that even if the entire Earth was land, there would still be seven of those creatures per acre. And that's just from one rock formation in, rock, in Africa. Uh, if one examines all these things that creationists say about all the fossils forming in the flood and, and so forth, and follows them to their logical conclusion, which they don't, uh, you come to lots of absurdities. And that, to my mind, shows that it is not, uh, not possibly a hypothesis that can be true. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Paulson, for coming. I will have to say it is very difficult to find opponents for debates on this topic. The majority of uh, evolutionists seem to want to stand in front of their freshman students where they have the academic and psychological advantage. 
and they don't want to seem to defend their faith. Uh, last week I was in Menominee, Wisconsin, and they asked 200 professors to come debate. They got zero takers out of 200 that were invited to the debate. Uh, a couple days, the week before that, I had a debate in Minnesota, and they asked, oh, probably 100. Two said they would do it if there could be two against one. Uh, it, is, it is really hard to find opponents for this subject, and yet I think it's a vitally important subject. I think students need to see both sides. The point is, both creation and evolution are religious. You have to take one or the other on faith. The Bible says pretty clearly, the invisible things of him, talking about the Creator, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. You can look at what's made and say there must have been a designer. Even his eternal power in Godhead, so they are without excuse. If you're here and you have been taught or believed in the evolution theory and believe there is no God, I'm sorry, God says you are without excuse. See, God does not believe in atheists. <laughs> the Bible says, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. Now, if you believe that we came from a rock over 4.6 billion years, you are deluded. You have believed a lie. And somebody needs to help you with that, and I'll be glad to help you. Okay? See, if creation is true, then there's a creator, obviously. If evolution is true, there is no creator, or there is not a creator who does it like he said he did in the Bible. If creation is true, there are rules, standards, right and wrong. If evolution is true, there are no rules. Please explain to me what is sin, what is wrong. If, if evolution is true, how do you decide right from wrong? I had a kid tell me one time he was an atheist, so I asked him the question, how do you determine right from wrong? He said, well, that's easy. I decide if something's right or wrong because I'm the God of my own universe. And folks, that's what it boils down to right there. Some people don't like the idea of rules. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. They don't like those rules. And so they'd rather choose a theory that says we came from a rock rather than accept the consequences of having some rules on their life. So since the kid told me he decides right from wrong, because he's the God of his own universe, I said, well, I'm glad to hear about that, son, because I'm going to shoot you in five minutes. He said, you can't do that. I said, oh, yeah, I can. I'm the God of my own universe, and I decided it's fine for me to shoot you. Now think about it. If evolution is true, how do you determine right from wrong? If creation is true, there's a purpose to life. God made you. He loves you. He wants you to come to heaven. If evolution is true, there's no real purpose to life. Strongest survive. If it feels good, do it. If creation is true, man's a fallen creature. He needs a savior. If evolution is true, you don't need a savior. Save from what? There's no such thing as sin. If creation is true, then man brought death into the world, and death is a horrible thing. But if evolution is true, death is a wonderful thing. That's how we get ahead. Think about it. If evolution is true, one species evolves a little better than the rest. What has to happen to this substandard? They have to die. See, if evolution is true, Adolf Hitler was right. Wipe out what you consider the substandard and this, let the superior race, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians, and the Germans, Guten uh, Abend, he said, let them be, take over. The, they they have more, need more living space, right? The superior race. If, if creation is true, there's an afterlife, not with evolution. If creation is true, you can know, you can know the future. I know I'm going to heaven. It's not because I deserve it. Are you kidding? If I get what I deserve, I'm in trouble. But I've been forgiven. If evolution is true, there's no hope of knowing the future. And if you're here and you've been taught in our humanistic school system to believe there is no God, evolution is true, well, I feel sorry for you, okay? You've been brainwashed. You've been lied to. The devil's a liar. The Bible says, He speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and the father of it. I'm convinced, after studying this for a long time, Satan is just using this evolution baloney to lead people to hell. He just wants to destroy your life, that's all. And he's laughing at you for believing in it. I mean, right now, he's laughing at you. <laughs> you believe by what I thought about coming from a rock, huh? Well, have at it, man. Enjoy yourself. The Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie. And God, which cannot lie, promised before the world began. God promised he'd save you if you'd ask him. 31 years ago, I said, Lord, uh, I'm a sinner. I've broken your laws but I believe you died on the cross to save me, and I'd like to ask you to forgive me. And I became God's child. He promised he'd save me, and he did. 
And that's why I'm going to heaven. It's because of God's promise, not because of my goodness. Closing thoughts. There's no evidence for evolution above the level of kinds. None. There's no evidence that proves the Bible wrong. There had to be a designer. Things are too complex. It stands to reason the designer had a purpose. Why did he design such a complex world? Everything you see. This was laying on the table when I got here. A rubber band. A gum band, an elastic, depending on what part of the country you're from. Even a simple thing like this, made of 100% natural products, it would be logical to conclude somebody designed it, and there must have been a purpose. Simple, right? It's simple to decide those kind of things, folks. And when you look at the world, if you're not blinded by this evolutionary theory, you can see there must have been a designer, and he must have had a purpose. Now, if you want to run from that, have at it. Have at it. But you'll stand before him someday and be judged. I don't want that. Closing comments, most important thing to me. I, want, I, I didn't come up here to talk about creation evolution so much, though I want to talk about it. I want to get, I want to get people going to heaven. When I got on the airplane this morning, my son had surgery three days ago. He'd like his daddy home with him. My wife has been in pain for three and a half months. She'd like her husband home. I travel every week of the year, not because I like being gone from my gorgeous wife and my family. It's because there's a war going on. And I want to bring folks to Jesus, that's all. That's why I do this. Tomorrow morning, I'm speaking at uh, um, Wildwood Baptist Church in Oshkosh. If you want to come, it's free. We'll have several seminars in the morning and in the evening. None of them will be repeats. We've got a lot of videotapes. I think, I don't know if they ended up here or not, but uh, they'll be at the church tomorrow. None of them are copyrighted. You're welcome to get my material, copy it, and then send it back and get your money back. If you're here and you already believe the Bible and you already believe on, in creation, then what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Find something to do. There are thousands of kids in this town being taught evolution. Thousands of them in this university. This is a mission field right here. Some of you Christians ought to say, man, let's, let's, get, let's get some of these kids converted back to common sense. They believe in God made them instead of they came from a rock. Thank you so much for coming, and we'll do this again anytime. <laughs>